really depressed, incredibly <laughs> deflated, because it's almost like all the time you're working on a, on a, on a new record, um, it's only you and the band. And and it, you get very you get very much into a kind of closeted vacuum kind of state where you're not listening to anyone else's opinions except your own, and you feel really strong about that because you fuck the record company, fuck what the fans want, fuck what the record company, fuck what the media are expecting, fuck all. You just make the record to please yourself, and at some point you have to give it to the label, and they have to give it to all the journalists and all the media, and then they all start having their fucking opinions. No offence, guys. <laughs> so their opinions about the record, and it's uh, I can't. Tr I try to avoid reading any reviews now because it's quite depressing. Even when people like the record, <laughs> it, it's the, guaranteed something will still annoy me if I read a review. They compare it to some band I don't like, or or they've got the wrong idea about a lyric and they've totally misunderstood it. And all this. And, I, and in a way I understand that's what music is about. It's all about interpretation and putting your own kind of spin on things. And that's one of the great things about music. But it's also quite um, hard for the writer and the person who wrote the music. <laughs> um, it's not, it's not a kind of self-conscious way to say, wow, well, look how, how hip I am, name-checking a hip-hop album. But I, I personally, there are so many things I could say about this. I, the first thing to say is that when I was growing up in the 80s, Public Enemy, Fear of a Black Planet, was a very important record if you were a teenager. A lot of my friends had the record. I had the record. Also, bands like De La Soul, Tribe Called Quest, the original wave of hip-hop bands in the 80s were very important to my generation. And the interesting thing about Fear of a Black Planet, of course, it's a, it's a very serious commentary on race relations, which was a real issue in the 80s. I mean, there was the Live Aid concert, there was the Nelson Mandela concert, there was, where, where I was growing up in London, there was lots of rock against racism concerts all the time. It was a very key issue for young people. And I think two things now. Firstly, I think hip-hop culture has become something quite horrible, some, something quite grotesque to me. It's become everything it's set out to, to not be, if you know what I mean. It, in the 80s it was still very experimental, it was quite vital, it was quite, quite dangerous, it was speaking about very important things, and it's become very banal and very mainstream. I mean, there are a few exceptions, but I'm talking about the really big, you know, you don't see bands like Public Enemy anymore, the real kind of mainstream artists talking about really important things to young people. I don't like the influence it's had on fashion, I don't like the influence it's had on music, and at the same time, there are a whole, for me, there seems to be a whole new set of issues for young people. Um, and one of the things, and some of them I don't even think they're aware of, and one of the main things for me is how is the whole issue of information technology, the internet, iPods, cell phones, playstations, 500 channels of digital, too. how is all this affecting young people and in particular their ability to develop curiosity and passion about the world, you know. If you don't need to leave your bedroom, because you can download all the music you want, you can download all the pornography you want, you can download any movie you want, you can see all the news, you can play PlayStation for hours all night long. If you, do, if you never leave, need to leave your bedroom, how does that kind of affect you psychologically? How does that affect your curiosity about the world outside you? And so, in one respect, the, the title was a kind, of, uh, a kind of joke on the Public Enemy album, but the second time, it, I, I am genuinely afraid that this generation of young people are going to be much blanker. And by that I mean less, more passive, less curious, less passionate about the world than, <coughs> say, my generation. Um, it's just the way it happened. I didn't, I didn't plan it that way, but we, we, we worked very closely together on this record, particularly Gavin, the drummer. Mm -hmm. um, work very closely and of course the thing now is that a lot of bands and we're no exception all have their own little studios at home so everyone takes away and because it's all recorded on hard disk everyone takes away the, the the files and kind of works at home you know and then brings stuff back so I couldn't honestly you know in 
take credit for something that Richard, say the keyboard player, had gone home and done at home. I can't <laughs> say I produced that. I wasn't even there when he did it. So it, it's just, I think it's a kind of evolution in the way that bands make records now, is that very often people are kind of working at home and bringing files back to the band, and, and that's the way we kind of made, not all of the record, but certainly some of the process was done. <laughs> Heard the material before we recorded it for the first mm -hmm. time in the band's history we actually went out and we played the whole record with one exception which we wrote afterwards the whole record with this one exception was played live uh, in about 30 cities last last late last summer and early fall mm -hmm. so when, by the time we went into the studio we kind of we lived through the material we were very familiar with all the little subtleties we developed Things like guitar solos and things, which, which which usually you kind of put together in the studio and take hours, it had already been kind of figured out on the road. When you're in the studio, you're working on an album, it's the subtle things that take the time, like the guitar solos, you spend hours constructing a guitar solo. This time we'd come off the road and we'd worked all those things out. So literally it just became a process of documenting what we already knew, mm -hmm. rather than kind of still developing creative aspects. Of it. Uh, well, Robert is uh, someone we've known for a long time. Uh, we've, in fact, he's toured with us um, in Japan, America, and England. And uh, we got to know him quite well while we were on the road with him and became quite, you know, good friends with him. And so that was kind of easy, you know. It was just we kind of knew we wanted Robert on the album. We talked about it many times on the road. I think he's an incredible musician. I wasn't there when he did anything. It was kind of a case you give, you get, we gave him the tracks and he went away to discipline in his studio and he created lots of soundscapes and solos and stuff and then gave me back the files. And actually it was the same with Alex because Alex was right in the middle of recording the new Rush album. So I just sent two tracks out to him in Toronto and a couple of weeks later I got back um, some ideas and, and some overdubs. And I've since met Alex. We, we toured in America last year, uh, in Canada last month, so I got to meet Alex in Toronto, um, which was a pleasure. And Alex um, was someone I didn't know at all before, but I found out, I was reading an interview with him in the British magazine, Classic Rock magazine, you know that magazine? And he was being interviewed uh, by a guy that had also interviewed me like a week before, Dave Ling, his name is. And Dave asked Alex, what do you think about the current wave of new so-called progressive bands that are, that are influenced by Rush and he mentioned Coheed and Cambria, Opeth, Tool, Porcupine Tree and Alex kind of jumped immediately on Porcupine Tree and said oh I love that band you know and I was reading this at home and I kind of fell off my chair you know <laughs> so I grew up listening to Rush and I had no idea that Alex even knew who Porcupine Tree were so I was really excited and I got in contact with Alex through Dave, the journalist, and, and was very happy to, to get a reply back from Alex saying he wanted to work with us.